Okay, this is my lecture on Richard LaCroix, L-A, capital C-R-O-I-X, who wrote a one-page article called The Paradox of Eden, which, by the way, is in my Dropbox. Maybe I'll put it on my website. We'll see. Um... Eden as in the Garden of Eden. All right, so a little background about the story, of course, of the Garden of Eden for anyone who might not already be familiar with it. It's in the first book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as Christians consider it. There's a version of it in Islam, but that version is slightly different. And Richard LaCroix is referring to the Hebrew version, Christian version, Judeo-Christian version. Um... You know, God created in this story the, the world, the earth, mankind, Adam and Eve, and all the creatures in the Garden of Eden, and they were in the, in the Garden of Eden, and God commanded them to be fruitful and multiply and enjoy the fruit of all the trees in the Garden of Eden, except one, the tree of knowledge, but not just knowledge in general, the knowledge of good and evil. For on that day surely you will die. God warned them. And according to the story, the serpent in the garden, the most deceptive creature who represents allegedly Satan or the devil, whispered in Eve's ear, reasoning with her about how God doesn't want her to have the knowledge that he has. And if you eat the fruit, then you'll be like God and something like that. And Eve, you know, fell for it, and then she spoke to Adam, and he fell for it, and then the both of them, uh, well, God um, couldn't find them. They were hiding, which doesn't make sense, because um, God's everywhere and sees and knows all things, but that's neither here nor there. You know, where are you? And they were hiding, and they were naked, and they realized they were naked, rather, and they covered up their private parts with fig leaves or something like that, and God banished them from the Garden of Eden. Um, and he placed uh, two angels, of seraphim or whatever, I forget which kind of angels they were, at the gates of the Garden of Eden to keep them out so they wouldn't have access to the Tree of Life. Um, presumably, um, they lived quite a long time, but didn't actually die that day. But some defenders of the phrase that day will tell you that, oh, uh, you know, they lived for a long time and a day in God's language is different from a day in human language. But, you know, that's a topic for another discussion. Uh, we'll leave those details aside for now. But um, I want to say something about the narrative complexity of the story. And that is that it fits into a larger um, narrative, which is that, you know, it would explain why uh, if an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God created human beings in his image and likeness, that we're not like little gods in paradise, right? Um, so the story uh, talks about some idyllic paradise, childlike innocence that we once had, uh, which kept us close to God, and we might have lived forever in a heavenly state if we hadn't you know, made the mistake of separating ourselves from God by not listening to him, and trying to have our own knowledge, uh, which was a kind of human arrogance, like um, Prometheus grabbing fire from the gods or something. Uh, it's a separate religious story. But it would explain, you know, our fall from grace. And according to that narrative uh, in Judaism, when the Messiah comes, you know, he will represent the redemption of mankind. And Christians believe that that's what Jesus represents. Right, so it's kind of part of the divine drama of God creating mankind, mankind separating himself from God and then reuniting with God in the end. And it's all part of a much larger interlocking set of narratives that explain all sorts of human virtues and vices and which depict human character traits, um, you know, the way Shakespeare does and stuff like that. So like the narrative in the Genesis story is part of a much larger narrative that has tremendous narrative cohesion um, from a certain perspective, 
explanatory, you know, a kind of explanatory richness in terms of the meaning of life and the purpose of life and why we're here and what happens when you die and all that kind of stuff. It kind of answers all the big questions in a way, right? And so that whole interlocking set of meanings creates one vast narrative structure that the religious believer draws tremendous kind of existential sustenance from if they buy into that story, right? But um, LaCroix is going to kind of pluck out just one little detail and focus on that. Well, maybe just two or three details, right? Uh, but really, the focus is on one, God's commandment to Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And um, before we look at that one little detail, I want to say a couple of things. One thing, uh, a quote from my karate teacher, my beloved late Sensei Warren K. And then another thing about a con game called Three Card Monty. And then we'll proceed. So uh, Sensei K had a student in our class who frequently made foolish remarks. And Sensei would chide him or whatever. But um, once, Sensei was also somewhat of a comedian. It reminded me a little bit of Yogi Berra with these kind of double meaning, almost seemingly silly remarks, but that they were kind of deep in a way. Uh, this is not really necessarily one of them, but they kind of, it's a kind of sign of his, um, the depth of his thinking. So when this student made this silly remark, Sensei said something like, you know, that kind of makes sense. If you don't really think about it, and then he just waited to see how long it would take for that student to get it or if he would even get it. Um, because getting it means that it only makes sense if you don't think about it. And that's a double negative, right? It doesn't make sense if you do think about it or something like that, right? Um, something like a double negative. So the point is, if you think about it, it doesn't make sense. That kind of makes sense if you don't think about it. And I love that quote for philosophical issues in general, because almost every philosophical issue is about something in our lives that kind of makes sense if we don't really think about it. Whether it's a concept, a fundamental belief, a value, a theory, whatever it is, is so, so many of the things that we take for granted only kind of make sense because we don't really think about them. All right. So we're going to really think about that one commandment. That's what LaCroix is doing. So let's just really think about that one commandment. So now, as I mentioned Three Card Monty, I said it's a scam because it goes something like this. Like in New York City, I don't know if you said how, how widespread this is, but in New York, I saw this many times where on a sidewalk, you know, in a busy area, you'd have uh, a guy who would have like a little crate or a little table or a cardboard box, you know, it's a quick and shifty kind of setup where they have three cards face down. Right, and turn one over and show it to you, like the Queen of Diamonds or whatever, right? And then turn it back down. And another person there who seemed like a passerby would stop and look and watch. And the guy running the show would say, I bet you you can't. I'm going to shift these around. I bet you you can't tell me where that card is when I'm done. I'll just shift them around a few times. You think you could do it? And the guy said, yeah, I bet you I could do it. And put down 10 bucks. You know, how much you want to bet? Oh, 10 bucks or 20 bucks, whatever. And then the guy does it and like the, the passerby wins, right? Because he's a plant anyway. He's friends with the guy who's running the show. And that could happen once, twice, three times or whatever. And um, it might even go on for a while where he wins like three out of four. He has to lose occasionally and get pissed off and whatever. But then the onlookers will go, yeah. Yeah, I was watching. I, I think I could do it. And, then, and that's how they take the onlookers when they say, yeah, okay, here, they put my money down, right? That's three card Monty. So the reason I mentioned three card Monty is if there was only two cards, it would be harder to scam people, right? Harder to move them that quickly. If there's only one card, you can't trick anybody, right? So um, I'm not saying that the authors of Genesis were playing a three card Monty. But what I am saying is that the shifting narrative complexity of the story, all the different components, God, you know, made man in his image, 
Adam named all the animals, a rib came out of Adam, made Eve, uh, God commanded them, told them, be fruitful and multiply, uh, don't eat the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, the serpent tricked Eve, Eve spoke to Adam, Adam broke the command, both of them wound up out of the garden, and then, like, that's the fall of mankind, and the birth of sin, and then Cain and Abel, and, you know, one thing after another, right, At the, all sorts of consequences for mankind, uh, and womankind, pardon me, um, are alleged to have been the results of Adam and Eve's errors, right? So that greater narrative complexity makes sense. There's a kind of narrative cohesion to it all, right? When you tell a story that has a plot and meaning, which develops and, you know, things fit in together like pieces of a puzzle and they make a kind of sense, right? And what I'm saying is without all those pieces, which seem to make sense, if you really look at any one piece by itself, it's problematic, right? Particularly this one piece that LaCroix is plucking out, right? So let's remove all the other cards in the 20-card Monty of Genesis uh, and just look at the one card, which is the commandment. Don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And then we'll see, as my sensei said, that it kind of makes sense if you don't really think about it. And we're really going to think about it. And then I assure you that it won't make sense. And I'm not saying you might not try. You might not. Of course, you'll try if you're a believer in the story. But I'm not saying that you can't possibly resurrect some kind of credible explanation or defense of it or a new interpretation of it or something like that. My point, and I think LaCroix, LaCroix's point, is merely this. If you look carefully at one little detail like that, on its face, it makes no sense at all. Right? It's problematic. And so many stories like this are problematic. And then if you put them all together, really, once you've noticed the problematic nature of each part, then that appearance that they all hang well together, that doesn't work. But that's a larger project, and we're not going to engage in that here. We're just going to stick with that one little sample, because it's that one little thing is supposed to explain the bulk of the misery of mankind. All right. Okay. So what's God's first negative commandment? Right? Don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? Now, some people will immediately try to turn that into a two-card Monty thing, right? by asking whether or not that commandment involved a literal fruit or metaphorical fruit. And the metaphorical fruit of a tree of anything uh, is that you get that thing that it's a tree of, right? So if it's metaphorical, which by the way, almost all theologians seem to think that it's metaphorical, meaning it's just, it's not literal, right? What's the metaphorical meaning of the commandment, right? What would you have if you violate the commandment metaphorically? you'd have the knowledge of good and evil, right? Well, even if it was not not metaphorical, if it was literal, then you'd eat the fruit and then you'd get the knowledge of good and evil, right? There aren't that many fruits and vegetables that you can eat that will alter your mental states. But um, I wonder if the people who wrote this story had eaten some kind of mushrooms or something like that. <laughs> That's just a joke. Okay, but to get you to think about, well, the literally, like literally, imagine if you, you could eat the fruit and it would do something to you and it would kick in and open up your moral knowledge center in your brain, right? That's possible. I don't know. Um, humor aside. So let's restate the command, right? Given that metaphorical meaning or the literal meaning, right? Don't develop what? Right? Don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you eat it, you will get this. And we don't want you to develop this. What is this? The knowledge of good and evil. Don't develop the knowledge of right and wrong. Don't develop the knowledge of good and evil. Don't develop, we put those things together, moral knowledge. Right? Remain morally ignorant. Don't know the difference between right and wrong. I command you. As Warren K, Sensei K would say, that kind of makes sense if you don't really think about it. So let's really think about it, right? And this, I'm going to think about it a little bit before we even get into LaCroix's version of the problem. Why would God, who is all good, 
who's allegedly made us in his image and likeness, and he's all good and all knowing, want us to remain ignorant and not know the difference between good and evil or right and wrong, not be able to recognize the goodness of God or goodness of goodness. That makes absolutely no sense to me. But that's just me. All right. So, before we go into LaCroix, I want to transition from what we've said so far into one of the two options that LaCroix will look at. Because what LaCroix is going to say is that, look, either, either Adam and Eve already knew the difference between right and wrong, or they didn't. It's got to be one or the other. And what LaCroix is going to say is either one of them doesn't work. But what I'm going to say is, before we even get to that, there's reason to think that one of them is the one that the Bible implies. And the reason for that is, if you use what philosophers call the principle of charitable interpretation, right? So if you want to interpret anything charitably, generously, hospitably, not combatively, not in an attempt to take it apart, but in an attempt to respect it, right? On the assumption that there's meaning in it and knowledge and information, right? Or that the person who utters the claim has some wisdom or knowledge or good intention or good idea that they're trying to convey, right? We have to interpret what people write or what they say, right? And if it's not clear, then we, we want to make sure we're interpreting it correctly, right? So one of the principles of interpretation of what others say is the principle of charitable interpretation, which says, assume that the author of the claim is knowledgeable and has a good idea that they're trying to convey, Right? So you don't want to interpret it in a way that will make them look stupid or sound stupid, because that's obviously not what they intend to do. Right? So how, how could we interpret that commandment or that whatever it is, not just in this case, but in any case, how can we interpret what people say in a way that honors the assumption that they're intelligent and that they have a good idea or a good intention that they're trying to convey? Right? So that's the principle of charitable interpretation. Philosophers are supposed to observe that principle. Whenever we hear each other's arguments, claims, beliefs, theories, whatever, we, we have to assume that the other person is operating in a way where they are trying to figure out what's good, what's right, what's true, right? And, 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 and they're trying to share that with us. And how do we use our interpretive ability to figure out the best version of what they're trying to convey, not the worst version? When you do the worst version, Right? You take what somebody says, maybe because you don't like them or you disagree with them or they're a member of the opposite political party as you are or something like that, your opponent or your enemy, they're in competition with you. And so you take the worst possible interpretation of what they say, which is the complete opposite of the best possible interpretation of what they say, and you act as if that's what they've conveyed, something that will make them look stupid right, and make them, their intentions look bad or anything like that. We actually call that a fallacy. A fallacy is an error in logical reasoning, right? And it's called the fallacy of straw man. Because when you do that, you defeat a mischaracterization, a substitute, a bad substitute for what the person is intending to convey. You pick a substitute that's worse than what they're trying to say, and then you attack that and make it look like you've attacked the person when you really haven't even attacked their argument. You've attacked something that looks like their argument, but a really bad version of it. Right? So if you defeat a straw man, you haven't really defeated the real man. Right? So it's kind of um, those two poles. The best possible interpretation, the least, least possible or worst possible interpretation. Right? Charitable interpretation, that's a principle we want to go by. The fallacy of straw man, we don't want to do that. Right? So applying that logic, that principle of interpretation to God, God is all-knowing, he's all-powerful, and he's all-good. Right? So he knows everything that Adam thinks and knows. He made Adam. Right, He's not confused about anything, even if us reading Genesis might be confused. And God says, don't develop the knowledge of good and evil. Remain morally ignorant. Right? Well, we have to assume that God wouldn't try to trick mankind. He wouldn't be dishonest with mankind. He wouldn't try to mislead mankind. So we have to assume that Adam didn't already have the knowledge of good and evil. Right? He, already, he really was morally ignorant. 
Otherwise, it wouldn't be fair to assume that God knows that Adam's not morally ignorant and is confusing him by telling him, remain morally ignorant. Right? That makes no sense, and that would be an uncharitable interpretation. So the principle of charitable interpretation strongly supports one of the, one of the two options, that either Adam knew or he didn't know already the difference between right and wrong. Right? And the principle of charitable interpretation says it's this one, he did not know. If he already knew the difference between right and wrong, and God said to him, don't know the difference between right and wrong, that would make no sense. That would make God look confusing, dishonest, deceitful, or misleading, right? So the principle of charitable interpretation clearly favors the view that he did not know. Okay, so we're going to go with that. But nonetheless, LaCroix is going to entertain both. He's going to say, you know what, it doesn't matter which one you think it is, or which one you think the Bible implies, because neither one of them makes sense, right? So now that's LaCroix's argument. My argument was the principle of charitable interpretation implies that Adam didn't know, all right? But it doesn't matter. If you don't like that option, go for the other one. That's not going to help you either, right? And that's LaCroix's dilemma. The paradox involves a dilemma. Dilemma, die in Greek, and lemma. Die means to, lemma means branch or limbs, two branches, the fork in the road. Either way you go, it's not going to work. That's what I'll have a dilemma. I don't, if I do this, this happens. But if I do that, that, and they both stink, you know? Dichotomy, dilemma, same thing. So here's the dilemma, which LaCroix thinks is a paradox for the believer, right? Because either way, it's not going to work out. And a paradox, recall, is when you have two contradictory beliefs or options right, or two statements or two ideas that you sense that they can't both be true, right, but you're inclined to believe them or something like that, right? So there's a kind of paradox here for the believer, right, who wants to believe that God makes sense and that God is good, but this story doesn't make sense, right? Um, Okay, so here's the two options. Either Adam knew the difference between right and wrong, already before God even spoke to him and gave him the commandment not to know, right? Either he didn't, either he knew or he didn't already know. That's it. It's got to be one or the other, right? Either Adam knew or he didn't know the difference between right and wrong. Either Adam had moral knowledge or he didn't have moral knowledge, right? So we'll go with the one that says that he didn't because I, the repetti over here thinks that principle of charitable interpretation says we should start with that one because the assuming God is good, he's not tricking Adam and everything, then we got to go with that one. That Adam didn't have the knowledge and then God told him, don't get it, stay the way you are. All right, but think about it now. If he didn't already know the difference between right and wrong, or the, the difference between good and evil, he wouldn't even know what those words meant. Right? It would be like the knowledge of gzz, gzz, gzz. <laughs> what? If he, right, because we're on the assumption that he doesn't know the difference between good and evil, right? If he doesn't know, then he doesn't know the meaning of those terms. He doesn't know that good is the opposite of evil, right? Or that right is the opposite of wrong. Right means not wrong, and wrong means not right. They are in direct polar opposition to each other. You can't know the meaning of one of them without knowing the meaning of the other. The meaning of right means not wrong. And the meaning of wrong means not right. (laughs) Right? Same thing with good and evil. They're the opposite of each other. So if Adam didn't know what those words mean, then he couldn't even understand the commandment. And he didn't already know, if he didn't already know the difference between right and wrong, then he didn't already know that it's wrong to disobey God, or that it's right to obey God. He wouldn't know that it's wrong to listen to the serpent or that it's right not to listen to the serpent. He wouldn't know that God is good and the serpent is bad because he doesn't know what those words mean. He's morally blind and ignorant. So God and serpent, equal, right? So if he didn't understand and couldn't possibly know, it doesn't seem at all fair to punish him for doing something that he couldn't have possibly understood was wrong until after he did it, assuming that he got the knowledge after he did it. But it just makes no sense at all. The problem is, 
it seems unfair of God to punish Adam, who was completely morally ignorant, for doing something that he couldn't have understood even was wrong. Now, defenders will say, oh, well, even a child doesn't know, and the parent tells them don't do that, and then when they do it, the parent punishes them, and that's how they learn. Right. That's with human beings, because we grow up gradually, and that's how we learn. But that's not how Adam learned, right? Adam had no knowledge whatsoever. He did something he couldn't have known was wrong, and all mankind was banished from the Garden of Eden and suffered for things that they, we, we didn't even know. We're born guilty, according to this theory because of Adam's innocent mistake. God doesn't seem fair. That's the point. That's what's paradoxical. The believer in the story thinks God is the source of all goodness, justice, and fairness. Cosmic justice is heaven and hell and, you know, being punished for sin and rewarded for virtue. But this story seems unfair. God seems unfair. All right, so if you don't like this option, let's go with the other option right? Like, well, it makes sense to punish Adam because he already knew it was wrong to disobey God, right? A child knows that they have to listen to their parent, right? That kind of thing. So, okay. So now we're going with the other option, all right? Two options. We did the one option where Adam didn't know right from wrong. Now we're saying Adam already knew the difference between right and wrong. Well, if Adam already knew it's wrong to disobey God, right? And he already knew the difference between right and wrong, he already had the forbidden knowledge. And that's something that I talked about earlier when I said that interpretation violates the principle of charitable interpretation because that more directly makes God look like he's deceptive or he's confused. It doesn't make any sense, right? If Adam already had the knowledge of good and evil, this is the other part of the story, right? Then when the serpent said, oh, you'll get the knowledge of good and evil, and then you'll know what God knows that you don't know, he would say, or Eve would say, we already have the knowledge of good and evil. Like that command makes no sense. I don't stand to gain anything by eating from that fruit. It's kind of like, I'll make an analogy. If you're already completely stoned on pot, right? And I tell you, don't smoke that joint because you'll get high. You'll say, I don't need to smoke that joint. I'm already very high, right? Like, it makes no sense, right? So, like, technically, like, <laughs> if I did smoke another joint, and it, it wouldn't really add to how high I was once you reach a certain threshold, you know, I don't know if you've ever smoked an ounce of pot, um, and I won't say whether or not I have, but you can understand the point, right? If Adam and Eve already had the knowledge of good and evil, the commandment makes no sense. It makes God not look credible, right? It violates the principle of charitable interpretation. That's not the way that LaCroix puts it. What LaCroix just says is that Adam stood to gain nothing from eating the fruit. The commandment makes no sense. Adam in the story eats the fruit and gets punished. That part of the story just doesn't make sense. Right? If you really think about it, it just doesn't make sense. And so if you already had the knowledge, eating the fruit didn't give him the knowledge. He already had it. So there's no sense in punishing. In fact, this is my addition to the story. If he didn't eat the fruit, but having the knowledge of good and evil is justification for being punished, then when God created him with that knowledge, because we're going on the assumption in this model, right? We did that he didn't have the knowledge. Now we're doing that he does, right? The moment God created him, he should have kicked him out of the garden and saying, I'm kicking you out because you're the kind of being that I made who has the knowledge of good and evil. And the only kinds of beings that are allowed in the garden are beings that don't have the knowledge of good and evil. Not your fault. I created you that way. But this is just where beings like you wind up outside the garden of good and evil, uh, good and, good, uh, the garden of Eden. Um, because you have the knowledge of good and evil, you belong in a world that, you know, that's appropriate for the Islamic version of the story is something like that. It's not, it's like God destined mankind to be on earth because of, uh, I think, something like the knowledge of good and evil, uh, life is a test, and those two things are, you know, 
part of your test and you need to be tested to, you know, go through the whole saga of creation and all that kind of stuff. But I don't want to get into that story. I don't really know the full details of it. But from what I've heard from some of my Muslim students, it sounds less incredible, the Muslim version of the story. I'm not a Muslim, but their version of the story, I think, lacks some of the features of this story that make this paradox um, come into view. Um, right? But like, think about it again. Yeah, I, I want to emphasize this. Adam would have been subject to punishment even if he didn't eat the fruit because he, he was created with the forbidden knowledge. If he already had the knowledge, then he was created with the forbidden knowledge. And then it, it seems unfair. He, he, he should get punished whether or not he eats the fruit. But either way, actually, he shouldn't be punished because he was created that way. God created him with that knowledge. Right? So recap. If he didn't know already the difference between right and wrong, then he wouldn't know it's wrong to disobey God or wrong to listen to the serpent or listen to Eve or anything like that. And he couldn't even understand the commandment and it seems unfair to punish an adult-sized infant who doesn't even know what those words mean. With such huge punishment, God seems unfair. Other option, Adam already knew the difference between right and wrong. God created him with the forbidden knowledge. Therefore, the commandment not to cultivate the knowledge of good and evil makes no sense, doesn't make God look good, seems like a straw man, but the whole thing collapses there because God should have thrown him out of the garden the moment he created him. And that makes no sense. That's It's no fault of Adam's if God made him that way, right? So the summary conclusion is whether Adam knew or didn't know, either way, God seems to be unfair. And LaCroix, the way that he actually phrases the conclusion is something like this. Being just, being fair, being just, or justice is not one of God's essential features. Because if it was, then God would always be just. But in this story, God is not just, right? That's his conclusion. All right, so I was mostly talking about, I mean, I did both sides. I was mostly talking about the metaphorical or non-literal meaning of it, cultivating it. So let's talk about the actual fruit, right? The, non, the, the literal version, like an apple. So if eating an actual fruit causes one to know the difference between right and wrong, then right, either Adam already knew right from wrong or he didn't. You still have the same problem. If he already knew, then eating the fruit wouldn't add to his already knowing right from wrong, just like smoking another joint wouldn't, if, if he was created stoned, right, as if he had smoked an ounce of pot, Smoking a joint wouldn't have made him stoned, right? That's if he already knew eating the fruit wouldn't add to his knowledge. But if he didn't already know, then he wouldn't know that it would be wrong to eat that actual fruit. So whether the, whether you interpret the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as literally a piece of fruit or as metaphorically, you get the same problem. Okay, so now I want to go about talking about some other things that LaCroix doesn't talk about where... God contradicts himself in the story, right? Because God says, on that day, surely you will die. But Adam doesn't die on that day. He gets kicked out of the Garden of Eden, right? And God plants two seraphim, or I forget what kind of angels, at the gate of the Garden of Good and Evil. Make sure mankind doesn't get back in, because inside the Garden of Eden is a tree of life, which is kind of like the fountain of youth that Ponce de Leon was in search of. Right? If they had access to the tree of life, they would have been alive today. Right? So they didn't die that day, but they became subject to mortality when they no longer had access to the tree of life. Right? So God basically, in effect, turned them into mort mortals. A mortal is subject to death, and eventually they did die. Right? So the believer. Um, will make two little adjustments. On that day, surely you will die. Uh, maybe that translation, uh, that meant surely on that day, you'll become the kind of being who dies. Um, and since he died many years later, maybe the word, this is another defense that I've heard, that the word day 
doesn't mean the same thing to God that it means to human beings or to early humans who lived for a thousand years and all this kind of stuff. But those seem like kind of cheap ad hoc adjustments to defend the theory. Ad hoc means something like adjustments made to suit the occasion on hand. You know, they're kind of made up, uh, arbitrary, basically bogus. Okay, so that's one problem. Another problem is human beings seem more fair than God, the source of all goodness, justice, fairness, benevolence, love, mercy, compassion, forgiveness, all that kind of stuff. Right? We have simple principles in, in, in human justice, like the punishment should fit the crime. Right? So like Adam wasn't raised the way humans are. So humans are raised and we make little mistakes. We disobey our parents and we get little punishments and, and we, we disobey them in bigger matters. We get bigger punishments. And so we, we get domesticated over time to understand the differences between right and wrong and to know that there are negative consequences with uh, violating those principles, right? Um, so Adam and Eve were like adult-sized infants because they weren't raised, right? So think about a little child when there's a birthday cake, a really nice one, and the, the kid's allowed to run around. He's three years old, and there's a big party for aunt so-and-so, and the parents tell the little kid, don't touch the cake. Wait until we sing happy birthday, and I'll give you a piece of cake. And the little kid runs over and goes, ah, and sticks his hand in the cake. Right now, the parent might smack the little kid's hand or say, that's it, and wash the cake off and say, now you're going into your crib, you know, whatever. Right? That's a case of the punishment fits the crime. The kid doesn't really understand, so you, you, you can put a little consequence in there to try to teach them. Right? Although we don't, you know, it's politically incorrect to say that just slap the hand. Um but kill the child? We say, okay, you know what? I told you not to touch that cake. And now, suppose we were all Greek gods and you were an immortal, but I had the power to turn you into a mortal. You were my kid and you put your hand in the cake. You disobeyed me. So I'm going to convert you into a mortal. You know, 70 years from now, whatever, you're going to die. The punishment does not fit the crime, right? On that, God doesn't seem fair. Humans are more fair. Right? No good parent would condemn their innocent child to death or to mortality if they were immortals for doing something and when they were too young to understand that it was wrong. Not only that, but all of mankind is punished in this way. LaCroix, I think, says this is a paradox for the believer, right? Because we believe these are the stories of God's justice and goodness, but God doesn't seem to be essentially just, so he calls it a paradox. Paradox is where... You know, you realize that two of your beliefs or more uh, can't all be true, but you're still likely to believe them. You can only partially para-believe them, dox belief, paradox, partial belief, right? right? I don't think this is a paradox. It might be a paradox for the believer, but, um, and I'm not saying whether or not I'm a believer, but for me, it seems like a straightforward contradiction. God is good and God is unfair. That's contradictory. For the biblical believer, belief remains, so so it's quite a, kind of paradoxical for the believer, right? Okay. An alternative criticism that I would raise is that LaCroix only touches on one problem, but maybe that was good because of the one-card Monty thing, right? But there are other problems, right? Either Adam knew it's wrong to disobey or he didn't, right? If he knew, he already had forbidden knowledge, LaCroix says he would have nothing to gain from violating the command, so the command makes no sense. But I say, he, if he already had the forbidden knowledge, he was created guilty and would remain so even if he didn't eat the fruit. Now, I had mentioned that before. But eating moral knowledge producing fruit, literally or metaphorically, wouldn't give him something that he didn't already have. If he didn't already know, then he couldn't know whether to trust God, Eve, or the snake. I said that before, but... Uh, LaCroix doesn't say it, so I'm just emphasizing that these are some of my criticisms, not LaCroix's. All LaCroix says is either he knew or he didn't know. If he didn't know, he couldn't understand, then it would be wrong to punish him. And if he did know, he stood to gain nothing, and so God seems unfair. It makes no sense. Either way, the story falls apart. But I'm adding these other dimensions of the problem, and there are more. Like, why is moral knowledge bad? It makes no sense for God to tell us not to acquire moral knowledge, the knowledge of right and wrong. If Adam didn't know the difference between right and wrong, 
right? And he had cracked open a pomegranate and found that juice, the little red seeds, the juice is so tasty. And when he was hungry again, next time he was looking at Eve's head and noticed that it was kind of roundish and shaped like a pomegranate and wonder what kind of tasty fruit is in there? If he didn't know the difference between right and wrong, he could have just bashed her head open with a rock or bashed her head against a tree or something, right? And then, you know, tasted her brains. And um, that wouldn't have been wrong because he didn't know the difference between right and wrong. He'd have been obeying God and remaining morally ignorant. Right? Why would God want us to remain, remain morally ignorant? Especially if and since the whole point of human existence from the religious biblical point of view is to test us between right and wrong. How can you test us between right and wrong if we don't know the difference between right and wrong? How can we make ourselves into the kinds of beings who earn a seat in heaven if we can't know that this is right and that is wrong, this is good and that is evil, and choose the good? And now, no, your tape didn't freeze. I paused. Think about it. Remain morally ignorant. But the difference between right and wrong, and you're choosing one over the other, your free will, we'll talk about that in another discussion, is what matters in this life. It's the key point of the, the biblical explanation for our existence is that we're given free will to choose between right and wrong. If we choose right, we go to heaven. If we choose wrong, we go to hell. How can we do that? How could free will even matter if we don't know the difference between right and wrong? Then it'd be like choosing between oranges and tangerines. They're kind of the same, like the snake and God, morally ignorant, same. Devil, Jesus, same, if we don't know the difference between right and wrong. Right? Then there's this other problem that they knew they were naked. Right? The Bible says that this happened to them after they ate the fruit, which that also implies that they didn't know beforehand. Right? So that's why you can't go with the option that they already knew. It's inconsistent with the story. That's why I say the principle of charitable interpretation demands that we pick the option that they didn't know. All right? After they ate the fruit, then they realized they were naked. They felt guilty. They hid from God. They covered their bodies. Right? And this implies that the naked body is something sinful and that sex is sinful. But if we were created perfect, how could that be? God commanded us, be fruitful and multiply. What did that mean? Not be shameful and feel guilt and shame when you're multiplying. Doing what God says to do is good. So if God says, be fruitful and multiply, then being fruitful and multiplying is being pious, being holy and being good, doing what God commands us to do. So that's another contradiction, right? But, and then there's this other thing, which the hippies out there might like. If remaining morally ignorant is okay, right? then sex without knowledge of right and wrong is okay, somehow or another permissible, right? Then any kind of sex, adults with children, homosexual, heterosexual, human and animal, what is that called? Bestiality, uh, rape, incest, all those kinds of things. If we're morally ignorant, then they're all equal. Right? That's a problem. Why do we associate shame and guilt with their naked bodies after they got the knowledge of right and wrong? Prior to that, they were walking around, presumably, copulating, sorry, having sex, naked, happy, and free. <laughs> 
That's a hippie idea. All right, so then there's this other problem with the God being good and the serpent being evil. God is by definition supposed to be a perfectly good being. But either God created a wicked serpent, a wicked serpent to trick his favorite creature in paradise, which wouldn't be perfect, or God didn't create a wicked serpent to trick his favorite creature in paradise, but still allowed a wicked serpent to trick his favorite creature in paradise, and that wouldn't be perfect. In which case, either way, God doesn't seem perfectly good. Either he put the serpent there, or so he let the serpent get there, and even though he knows everything. And then some, of course, the defense against that is that there was a fallen angel, and the angel disobeyed God and turned again, it was, became Satan, and he had a certain realm of powers that God allowed and respected, and, you know, he tried to undermine God. And so now it's like, that's the... 12 card Monty version of the story that seems to make some kind of sense, but each little component of it is very problematic, right? Like, why would God allow? That's like, if I had my infant son when he was one and a half years old and he was a wild kid and I put him in the playpen where he's safe. Right? And I put some toys in the playpen that are safe, they're childproof. You know? Why would I put a snake in there? In fact, why would I allow the devil into my playpen to trick my son? Makes no sense at all. Right? We, ch we childproof the areas where our children play. We don't leave guns and knives and drugs and poison and sharp objects and needles and things like that in the playpen, right? This is the Garden of Eden. It was the playpen of baby humans. That's a problem. Okay, here's another problem. If having moral knowledge is bad or wrong, then if it was wrong to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then learning the difference between right and wrong would be morally wrong. And remaining morally ignorant would be good. Right? It's evil to know the difference between good and evil. But if it's evil to know the, good, good, the difference between good and evil, and God knows it, because he put the tree there, then is God evil? Also, if so, then either... If he knows right from wrong, he has the forbidden knowledge, God would be wrong or bad, right, for making him that way. Or if he doesn't know right from wrong, then, oh, God himself, right? Yeah, if God knows right from wrong, he has the forbidden knowledge, right, then God would be wrong or bad or evil. Or if he doesn't know right from wrong, then he would be morally ignorant. But if he's morally ignorant, then he's in no position to issue moral commands. So he would be wrong or bad to do so. Right? I mean, just you reason your way through this about God, even. Right? And just even the idea about from mankind. If learning the difference between right and wrong is evil, it's wrong, it disobeys God, that therefore it's necessarily evil, then having moral knowledge is evil. But God has moral knowledge. Or if he doesn't, then he's in no position to issue the command. That's the summary of that argument. Okay, then there's this other problem in Genesis. Incest in the first family. Right. Once they acquired moral knowledge, they were kicked out of Eden. They had moral knowledge when they, they were kicked out of Eden. So if they had moral knowledge, then they knew incest was wrong. Then where'd everybody else come from? Without incest, there'd be no children of Adam and Eve. Right? No, no children of Adam and Eve beyond their own children, I meant to say. If they never violated the command then they wouldn't know incest was bad. And then they would have to engage in incest to be fruitful and multiply, right? But their children came after they left the Garden of Eden. Like if they did that in the garden, then you could say, okay, well, you know what? Yeah, incest was okay in the garden because they didn't know the difference between right and wrong. And then there was enough of them that were cousins and grandchildren and all that. And so there was like, you know, enough generation, there was like four or five generations of, the offspring of Adam and Eve, when finally one of them ate the fruit, 
and then all of them got kicked out, then you could say, okay, well, there were enough of them that were second or third cousins that um, it's not really incest, right? But Adam and Eve were the only ones in town when they got kicked out of the garden. So where all the other kids came from that became mankind, uh, either Cain and Abel had sex with Eve. What are the other options? Where'd the other kids come from? Right? Okay. By following the command to be fruitful and multiply, they had to violate the no incest moral rule, whether knowingly or not. Right? What would the world be like without original sin? If no one had ever eaten the fruit, metaphorical or literal, then all human beings would have been multiplying with incest, right? And all kinds of weird sexual relations if they didn't know right from wrong or good from evil, right? Forever. If no one ever ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there'd be heads bashed in because they look like pomegranates and there'd be sex with all kinds of incest involved. And there'd be an infinite number of human beings all climbing on top of each other because there'd be no more room in the Garden of Eden. That's another problem. Population explosion in the Garden of Eden. Be fruitful and multiply, following the commands of God. Right? Overpopulation destroys mankind. But God would know all of this in advance. And so some people say, well, then that's why he set it up that way. Well, you know, I like... I don't know what to say to that kind of response. And you just have to pause when somebody says something like that. Like, so God intentionally deceived mankind because God had intended us to be thrown out of paradise and to suffer with the knowledge of good and evil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's a different religion anyway. That's not the religion that gave birth to that story. All right, so summary. We're almost done. The Garden of Eden story makes sense, kind of, if you don't really think about it. But if you really do think about it like LaCroix, then whether they knew or they didn't, God seems unfair. My problems, or Patty's problems, you know, my parts of it are about the three-card Monty thing, right? The whole narrative story makes sense only because of its complexity. Focus on one detail at a time, and then you can't put them together and get the same narrative meaning. Whether metaphorical or literal, same result. God contradicts, I'm summarizing the main points, God contradicts himself when he says, on that day surely you will die. Understand the meaning of die differently and the meaning of day. Humans seem to be more fair because we operate according to the punishment must fit the crime. And, you know, we also baby proof. I'll get to that again later. I think I'll say that again. If Adam knew he was guilty before he even ate the fruit, that option doesn't make sense because then had they realized that they were naked after eating the fruits of the whole thing, the charitable interpretation principle requires you to go with the option that they didn't know. Why is moral knowledge bad? That would prevent Adam from bashing Eve's head open to look for those pomegranate seeds. There's something wrong with the idea that knowing that they were naked when they got the knowledge of moral, moral knowledge, right? That non-innocent nudity and, not, uh, you know, that, I'm sorry, that innocent nudity and sex is good, but knowing the difference between right and wrong suddenly makes it bad. Why did a good God allow the devil into the playpen? If moral knowledge is bad, God has moral knowledge. So he's bad. Or if he doesn't have the moral knowledge, then he's in no position to make commandments about it. Incest had to happen with or without the knowledge 
simply by following the command to be fruitful and multiply. And if there was no original sin, if there was no violation of the command, overpopulation would eventually destroy the Garden of Eden anyway. So look, I've added a whole lot of things to LaCroix's one little thing, but they're all kind of related. And I brought them up. I like to bring up all these other things because they usually come up when I'm teaching this subject in class. Students will bring up, oh, what about this? And what about that? And all these other parts of the story that the story makes sense. And students will appeal to the way we learn and how we punish our children and how we even train our dogs and all this. And all those things are like they're parts of the narrative complexity of the story and how it fits in with other things that we know. But that only works if each little component of it works. Right? So look at each component in and of itself. Right? Just look, like I said, the principle of charitable interpretation requires you to take the view that Adam didn't know. But if he didn't know, then it seems unfair. That's LaCroix's major argument, right? But even if you want to say that he did know, then God doesn't make any sense in issuing that command. Adam stood to gain nothing if he already knew. All right, I think that's about it. But I'll just say one more thing before we go. Um, LaCroix and I are not out to attack religious belief. What we're trying to do, what philosophers try to do, whether they believe in God or not, is to get us to critically examine some of our basic fundamental core beliefs, stories, values, and see if we have good reasons for believing them, All right? What do you believe? Oh, say, I believe in the story of the Bible or whatever. Why do you believe it? You think about the reasons and everything, and then, right? Do your reasons for believing what you believe hold up under scrutiny, right? That's the whole point of philosophical analysis is to just tease apart the meanings of the the claims, the statements, the propositions, the beliefs that you have, and ask yourself, am I justified in believing that? Right? So does that belief make sense? What are the grounds of that belief? What sorts of things would justify it? What sorts of things would undermine its justification? The open-minded inquiry into whether or not a belief is plausible, rational, credible, believable requires you to look at both for and against all the evidence and reasoning for and against the view before you just simply accept it or maintain it, right? That's epistemology, right? The theory or study of knowledge and belief and evidence and justification, what justifies our beliefs? What justifies me thinking that I know something? Right? And so we're applying epistemology to one narrow little topic in the subject of philosophy of religion. Right? The problem of the Garden of Eden and the, the, the problem particularly of the commandment not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Ironically, I guess there's an extra motivation in it for philosophers because philosophy is the tree of knowledge. One of the branches on the tree of knowledge is the knowledge of good and evil. There are many other interpretations of this tree that come out of other traditions, mystical interpretations, mythical, metaphorical. Some of them are fascinating and interesting, um, but we're not talking about those. We're talking about this as if it was an historical event that God created human beings and commanded them in a specific way, and then punished them for violating the command. So we're taking that part of it as if it was a historical event and saying, does that make sense? Now you might say, well, it doesn't make sense as a historical event, but it makes sense as a mythical kind of thing. It has a much deeper meaning. And that's those are the dimensions of the story that the believer, student, bring up in class. They say, wait a minute, the story has greater narrative meaning. I'll grant that. I'll grant that. 
there's absolutely no doubt that there's such a richer, deeper meaning structure in these stories that have shaped Western civilization. All right, that's it for today. Thank you.